So, hi, Rob. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, we would like to give you 60 seconds for you to tell us your origin story and what you've been working on. Okay. So, uh, I'm Rob. I'm head of food policy at the Soil Association. Uh, my origin story, my personal origin story, uh, I guess, dates back 10 years or so of working um, in uh, campaigning and an NGO world, influencing and lobbying. For, for Amnesty International before uh, the Soil Association. The Soil Association's got a longer origin story, which I'm sure we'll come to. Um, but, but right now the focus is all on uh, sustainable food and farming, what we should eat, how we should farm, how we should resolve the, the climate and nature crises. That's amazing. And so Soil Association, what actually is soil? Because um, I feel I was told more about the solar system at school than I was about the ground under my feet. Yeah, right. So soil... You can think of soil as a, a living ecosystem. So it's made up of uh, organic matter and trillions and trillions of uh, microbes and, and small uh, microscopic life. So a quarter of all the species on the planet uh, live in soil, mainly microbial species. Uh, a single handful contains more organisms than there are people on the planet. Uh, and scurrying around within the soil, there are nematodes and anthropods and uh, <laughs> worms and all sorts of other um, uh, forms of bug life. And, and it all adds up to this really complicated ecosystem. And we rely on it for, for our food and also for uh, the, the functioning of various other above ground ecosystems, which uh, all interact to affect the climate. So soil is really at the heart of uh, much of the way that the, the natural world functions and the global climate. How does it affect the climate? Well, 80% of the carbon on planet Earth is locked up into the soil. So if you take all the carbon in the air, all the carbon in the vegetation, in the forests, it's only 20%. The rest is in the soil. So how we interact with the soil and, and the way that we treat it has huge implications for the, for the climate crisis. If we're farming well and, and planting trees and, and uh, treating our soils um, as they should be treated, then it can draw carbon out of the atmosphere. You can capture it uh, uh, and lock it in and, and help alleviate the, the climate crisis. But if you mistreat soils, then they start to release that huge carbon store. And intensive farming uh, is, is a key contributor to some of that release that, that we're seeing today, which on top of all the fossil fuels are, are adding to the climate crisis. So why does that happen? Is it because the composition of the soil has been affected through industrial farming? Yeah, that, that's it. So um, the, the microbial life of the soil interacts with with plants to help um, capture some of that carbon, uh, lock it into the the earth, um, and soil retains when it's healthy this this sort of structure and a certain uh, chemical balance and mineral balance as well. It's uh, uh, the, the ecosystem uh, is um, held together in this kind of delicate web, but it's quite a fragile web. Um, and when you uh, farm too intensively, you not only um, uh, diminish the microbial life, so so the soil becomes depleted. Um, but, but some of that carbon store uh, is, is also released because the soil isn't uh, uh, as alive as it was. Uh, that carbon can't be captured and, and locked up there for as long. Um, so the, the, the twin process of uh, kind of organic decline and carbon release both sit together and they're both fueled by intensive farming. And what's the current status of soil health in the UK and globally as well, if you know? It's uh, a mixed picture, but we know that globally there are huge um, uh, declines in, in, in soil health, a huge degradation problem. Uh, we lose somewhere in the region of 30 football pitches every minute um, to, to, to soil degradation wow. around the world. Um, so huge problem. Um, you, you can nurture soils back to life. You can uh, uh, help uh, return that microbial life and, and that fertility, but it takes a long time. You can degrade them a lot quicker than you can uh, uh, renew them. Um, in the UK, it's a mixed picture. There are areas of, in the east of England um, uh, around the Fens where um, there's a lot of quite intensive monocropping and we know that the the, the carbon rich peat soils there are, are releasing some of their carbon and that's that's a major contributor to the UK's land use carbon release. Um, and so our diets interact with, with these soils in different ways. We also have a, a global dietary footprint. Um, so a lot of the pork and poultry that we eat, um, it's been fed on feed crops that have been grown on the other side of the world. And those crops are often grown intensively. So there's soil degradation going on in, in South America and you don't necessarily know it when you're eating your chicken nugget. Um, so it's a, a complex 
web of uh, kind of relationships that we hold with the soil through through the way that we eat. Uh, but certainly we need to farm differently, both globally and in the UK, to make sure that we're looking after our soil. Can I just ask, what do you mean by microbial? Sure. So um, um, microbes like bacteria and, and viruses, um, really small organisms, um, uh, 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 live all around us. They live um, in, in great abundance in the soil, but also uh, uh, in, in, in the human gut, in, in, in plants and uh, on their leaves and stems and so on, and, and in animal intestines and guts as well. Um, so this, there's this uh, extraordinary abundance of life that we can't see, it's very small, but it, it plays a really um, important role in, um, in, in that soil ecosystem and also in our, in our own bodies as well, it affects our health in complex ways. There are more non-human cells in your body than there are human cells because of all these microbes um, living within your gut and we're, we're kind of symbiotic with them. So it's a, a hugely complex um, picture when we start to look at what, what a healthy soil is and how we should interact with it. But we're increasingly understanding that this microbial life is at the heart of, of that interaction. Wow. And does that affect the quality of our foods that we eat as well? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So we're, um, we're the, the research in this area is, is still emerging, but we know that um, uh, organic farming is is better for soil health. It, it, it nurtures more abundant soils, more fertile soils with with greater microbial life, and we know that um, that that microbial life stimulates um, uh, plants to to grow in in particular ways. Um, and we know that when we eat those plants, we we get some benefit from that. So there are uh, in organic crops, organic fruit and veg, for example. Uh, uh, higher levels of these polyphenols, these antioxidant compounds, um, 20 to 70 percent, roughly more, um, and their uh, growth as a plant uh, within the plant um, is part stimulated by microbes in the soil. It's partly a result of their interaction with pests and insects, which are more abundant on organic farms. So we know that what we do to the soil affects plants, and and when we eat the plants, that there are additional health um, giving properties when they are organic. So it, it's all entangled and, and intertwined. Mm. Well, and, and so we've been talking a lot about like soil health, organic food. And so does organic food support soil health in contrast to industrial agriculture, which depletes soil health? Yeah. So the I guess the key difference between organic farming and, and what you might call it intensive or industrial farming is that whereas um, with intensive farming approaches, your your aim is to produce as much food as you can from a piece of land using chemical inputs, so pesticides and, and chemical fertilizers. Um, and, and you can do that very effectively and get a very high yield, but in the long run, you exhaust the soil, it has environmental impacts. In organic farming, um, you're trying to harness uh, pre-existing biotic, biological and ecological processes to, to grow food. So you you don't use any chemical inputs. Um, you try and nurture a, a high level of diversity on the farm. So you grow different crops in a rotation in a way that returns fertility to the soil. Um, when, you, when you keep growing one crop as a monocrop um, repeatedly, you're taking nutrition and fertility out of the land and it's then just going off somewhere else, which is why intensive farming relies on these chemical inputs. But in organic farming, you, you use this rotation, you let the land rest, you let it recover and, and regenerate, uh, and you get a slightly lower yield, you get slightly less food out of it, but in the long run, it means that it's um, uh, far more sustainable. And I suppose it's often smaller scale as well, so you're supporting local economies and local farmers more than corporates, is it, that the case? It can be, yeah. You do get some, some really big organic farmers, but um, generally speaking, uh, organic farms are, are likely to be smaller scale mixed farms. Um, they're often selling through um, more local supply chains. I mean, they're in all the major supermarkets as well. You can get organic food anywhere, um, but but through farmers markets and box schemes as well. There's lots of ways of uh, accessing the, those those local producers. A mixed farm is and not a monoculture. Is that Sorry, it? Sorry, yeah, yeah, that's right. So where where the farmer is um, growing a kind of mixture of crops and, and livestock, uh, integrating them into the rotation to help build fertility. Mm. Um, it's interesting this because at the moment, you know, when when we're thinking about um, about f the food industry in relation to population increase, and then people start talking and just focusing on intensification of farming, which is actually destroying the ecosystems on which like these populations are relying on, um, 
And I think we need to be thinking, shifting our perspective and rather about intensification, um, seeing how we can make the food system function better because already a third of our food is wasted. A third of our food, I think, goes to livestock. I might be wrong, but um, that's yeah. my understanding. And so how can we like actually just sh- change the food system so that it's not destroying the ecosystems and it's just functioning more efficiently? Um, I'd like to break... Um, down like what are the actual main causes of soil erosion and soil depletion um, maybe unpack it a little bit more than sure. industrial farming so I guess the um, there are three main ones so the, there's the um, the repetition of monocropping so if you just grow the same crop on a piece of land over and over again um, then you uh, take nutrition out of the soil. You know, you're, there, there's um, a limited supply of certain nutrients in, in any farming system, nitrogen, potassium, and, and, and phosphate. Um, and if you look around in nature, there's always a, you don't get monocultures. There's a, a mixture of, of, um, of plants and animals, um, which all interact in a way to, to cycle fertility. And, and, and that, that fertility that you find in a wild ecosystem is being returned through uh, dead bodies, plants and animals, and, and the whole mixture of, of, of interactions in, in that ecosystem. When you have a, a monoculture, you're just taking. So that means that the land gets uh, uh, exhausted. And, and if you overwork it, it, the soil can lose its structure. Uh, so you then get uh, increasingly reliant on um, chemical inputs. So uh, nitrogen fertilizer and, and other mineral fertilizers, um, which often come in a package with, with pesticides. Um, and using these chemical inputs, you can boost your yield and you can you can keep producing food over and over again from that piece of land. But in the long run, the soil is degraded. Um, the, the, the pesticides, uh, uh, pesticide residues end up in the soil, in the water, in, in cocktails, um, which uh, uh, have a knock on effect for, for local wildlife, uh, diminishing wildlife. Um, and the, the fertilizers themselves damage the soil. So you get almost this... Um, uh, effect of becoming addicted to them. You, you need more and more to keep producing food to the same level. Um, and a lot of our food is, is produced in these systems. Um, you get farmers of all stripes and varieties across the UK. Many of them are doing great things, organic and non-organic. But when you look um, at where most of our food comes from and look where most of the food around the world is coming from, um, there's uh, far too far too much reliance on these systems. So we need a shift towards more organic style ecological modes of farming Mm, that's fascinating and um when soil association first begun it began in after world war ii um was there a relationship with world war ii yeah so it was um so in the wake of the second world war there was a, a a hungry population and a rapidly growing population um and major food shortages there was also a kind of surplus of chemical weapons and some of these chemical processes that had been developed for use in the war, which could be um, pressed towards the, the production of, of fertilizers and pesticides. Um, so the, the obvious policy for governments was to use these chemical inputs to, to produce as much food as possible because there were hungry people and it was a growing population. So it sort of made sense. Um, but from the beginning, there were concerns as to whether in the long run um, it would be um, viable. And they, um, so the Soil Association was uh, formed in the 40s by a group of farmers and, and nutritionists uh, and so on who were concerned by the, this, this sudden shift towards industrial and, and chemical-based farming. And from the beginning, there was a real focus on uh, health. They had this quite unusual conception of health. So they were, when we think of health today, we, we sometimes think of it as the sort of absence of sickness. But they had a much more active kind of understanding of health, more like vitality. Um, and they had a kind of ecological conception of it. So health was the um, vitality and interdependence of, of living systems. And the founding principle of the Soil Association was that the health of the soil and plants and animals and humans and the planet is one and indivisible. So it's all interconnected, um, which for its time was quite radical. Um, and and might sound a bit kind of out there, but we know now that this is true in, in, in various different ways, both in a sort of macro sense, when you look at the, the ecosystems we're embedded in and how they interact. Um, we, we know that uh, the health uh, of, of our planetary system affects the health of, of everyone in it. And, and it's and it's uh, there are these ripples of um, consequence uh, whenever we um, interact with the ecosystems around us. 
um, and down to the microbial level where we know that our, our bodies are uh, um, symbiotic with billions of trillions of microbes and how we treat the microbes in the soil and in our bodies and in the plants and animals yeah. that it, it does all uh, come together uh, in one big interactive um, uh, way so so this conception of health was really at the heart of it were they influenced by Schumacher and Gaia theory so Gaia theory came a bit a bit later um, I'm struggling to sh pin Schumacher on the the timeline but um but yeah, he's he he was he was an early organic pioneer. Um, it was Lady Eve Balfour and uh, Albert Howard, and, and Schumacher was was another one. Um, and it was um, yeah, there was a kind of philosophical element to to, to the way they were approaching it. But um, contemporary um, microbial science and earth system science has really borne out what what they uh, foresaw back then. And and this idea of health now is is. Uh, really needs to be at the heart of how we respond yeah. to the, the climate and nature crises. And what you were talking about chemicals just beforehand, it made me think about Agent Orange in the Vietnam War and Monsanto. Is How is that in the picture? Is that related? The production of these chemicals uh, has always been um, uh, in, entangled with these big corporate interests. So the production of ammonia gas during the war, the same production method was was then pressed to the production of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, uh, DDT um, was a, a, a chemical weapon that was then used as an insecticide, uh, which uh, Rachel Carson wrote about in her famous book, mm. Silent Spring. Um, and, and if you look look back along the last 50 years, the history is um, uh, just, it's just a story of one chemical after another being discovered to be wildly dangerous and, and then banned and then another one comes on the market and almost like this this treadmill of you just have to keep running and a new chemical comes and so we, we need to get off the, the treadmill. It's, it's crazy that the um, <laughs> chemicals used to like cause harm to humans have now been able to come into the like the food system which is meant to protect and create like and, and um, give nourishment to humans. Yeah. Um, and I mean, seeing the effect that it's having on the ecosystems, it's like that link is actually very clear. Yeah. And on the, um, like there's such a link from food to climate justice as well. Like it's interesting that beforehand you worked with Human Rights and Amnesty International and like the link between food and farming with climate justice is quite yeah. huge as well like particularly when it comes to the genetically modified food yeah um story as well like looking at the farmer suicides in india and yeah i mean yeah vandana shiva's like she's been campaigning on this this stuff for, for decades and and you can you can look in south america as well at, at where many of the feed crops that that feed our farm animals come from and the the impact of pesticide use there on 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 local communities um uh the um the, the pesticides um, that we use in the UK are fairly tightly regulated, but are still huge cause for concern. But when when you get um, down into the Cerrado and edge of the Amazon, um, they've been used in such abundance to grow these genetically modified crops that, that people have been getting really sick from them. Um, so there, there, there is a huge yeah social justice dimension. Yeah, that. and many indigenous are being killed at the moment, especially in the south there, like Mato Grosso and places yeah. like that, who are trying to protect the land. Mm. Um, There's four um, environmentalists are killed every week for trying to protect their uh, their, their land, um, water, forests. Yeah, yeah. and our and our diets are, are entangled with that. Yeah. There's there's three million tons of feed crop uh, comes into the UK each year, um, most of it from South America, and and a, a, at least half of that is more or less directly implicated in deforestation and damaging land use change and wildlife loss and with with social implications mm. as well. So GM is illegal is we're not allowed to grow GM crops within the UK are we but we are allowed to import it in other ways. So only for animal feed. So the only GM foods you'll find in the UK um are are fed to animals except for that there's like an oil which is sometimes oh. used in cooking for some reason that's that's allowed but but generally speaking yeah we we don't have GM foods here. We'll see what happens after Brexit, Brexit but um but yeah, millions of tons of, of animal feed comes in and it's it's almost all GM. I, I think it'd be interesting just to touch on um, GM, like what makes genetically modified food when it comes to patenting and things. Could you explain a little bit about that as well? So, I mean, the, the, there are different, uh, I guess, uh, schools of thought on what, what the, the biggest issue with GM is. But um, the, 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 the one, I guess, to keep uh, right in focus is the... The corporate capture of, of patents and and um, and ownership and power distribution across the supply chain. Um, when farmers become dependent on these big companies for, and they have to buy seeds new each year, they can't swap their seeds. They can't 
uh, uh, share them, they become uh, very dependent and, and they can end up in debt. And this is what we've seen in India, um, where they, they lose their, um, their independence. Um, and the, the magic crop, which grew really well the first year, gets progressively less productive and they're plunged into further debt. Um, so there are complex questions around the, the safety of these crops. Um, and we in, in Europe take a precautionary approach. And it's really important that after Brexit, we, we keep uh, aligned with that precautionary approach. But the, the big question when you're thinking about how to design any food or farming system is where does the, the power lie? And, and, and we think at the Soil Association that um, farmers should be uh, in control, that it shouldn't be big multinational corporate companies. Um, you should have um, a, a fair price for farmers, uh, power evenly distributed throughout the supply chain, and, and farmers empowered to swap their seeds and, and build genetic diversity on, on their own farms, not, not be reliant on these. Uh, big corporations mm. and do you think um i guess because we're in the uk we'll use the uk as a case study but do you think it's possible to be able to roll out organic farms across the uk and to replace the food that that isn't organic with all organic because you say that in the uk um pesticides are controlled but still 16.9 thousand tons of pesticides are used every year and yeah. i think um a one arable crop will be sprayed 17 times yeah. in its lifetime, which is tw which is which has doubled in the past 20, 25 yeah. years. So, um, like, how can we actually can can we stop using pesticides yeah. because it was well with like, the decline in insects and if it's feeling like we need to, but then you have this whole narrative um, of being like climate smart, which means intensification of agriculture, yeah. which is actually destroying the ecosystems on which we're relying. Yeah. So um, yes, we can do, and we and we have to for exactly the reasons you just said. Um, we know that um, uh, pesticides are globally that they're, they're a key part of the the, um, the picture in terms of insect declines and pollinator declines. Uh, in the UK, um, uh, they're they're also part of that picture, and we have one of the uh, we've been described as one of the most uh, nature depleted countries in the world. Um, we in terms of the on farm biodiversity that we've lost in the last fifty years. Um, so we can do it, um, and, and we know this because of some recent bits of modelling that have been done, um, particularly by a French think tank called IDRI, who looked across Europe and said um, that they didn't actually say, what if we all go organic, because organic has the extra um, uh, layer of certification and inspection, and you've got the stamp on it, and we, we can talk about that, but it was the equivalent of organic. So they said, what if we farmed uh, following agroecological approaches, which... which um, uh, are broadly like organic. It's, it's based around the same set of principles. And they found that we, uh, we'll have to take a, a, a hit to the yields, um, so we won't produce quite as much food. We'll maybe produce 30% less of some crops. Um, but if we eat differently and use our, our land differently, then you can still produce enough healthy food to feed a growing population, and you can do it while preserving biodiversity and, and achieving that, that net zero target for, for 2050. And the key changes to our diets around um, the, the proteins that we eat. So half the farmland in the UK at the moment, um, half the arable land is used to grow um, crops for animals. Um, so we, the first thing that we do is we stop competing with animals for food. We only um, have uh, ruminants on grass and we feed pigs and chickens on waste and crop byproducts Can and, you and leftovers. Can just clarify what ruminants are? Sorry, yeah, ruminants are uh, cows and uh, sheep who have a, uh, can digest grass because of a, a part of their gut called the rumen. So, so then they wouldn't be kept in sheds factory farming, they'd only be kept on grass. Right, wild. yeah, exactly. So, um, wild, in the so at the moment, most of the, the pigs and chickens that, that we eat and, and a large part of the dairy is um, uh, fed on, on feed crops, on, on these crops um, that are grown on land that could otherwise be used to feed humans. Um, beef cattle and some dairy cattle are, are mostly on grass, um, but most of the meat that we eat, um, uh, we're in kind of competition with those animals for food and land. Um, so if we end that competition, if we stop importing feed crops from South America, if we stop using our farmland to grow um, crops for animals um, and just use waste streams and crop byproducts and food waste to feed the pigs and the chickens and, and put the cows on the grass, um, uh, then we can make it all, we, we can make the, the pieces of the puzzle all fit together. Mm -hmm. um, it means eating roughly 60% less meat overall on average. Lo lots more vegetarians and vegans are a good thing, but, but animals still are... are, are central part of that farming system, but much, much less meat to go around. Um, but you have the benefit that those animals have much better lives. 
that there, there are massive reductions to, to to wildlife loss and climate emissions associated uh, with intensive farming. So it's it's what we should be aiming for, and we know that we can do it. Um, we just have to. So agroecology you know. is kind of the key to bringing together um, to addressing climate change or climate collapse and then also addressing biodiversity and communities yeah like agroecology is yeah. i think is a key way to maintaining strong yeah. communities absolutely yeah i mean the the exactly as you just said the key thing to keep in mind is that we have a it's not just a climate crisis it's a nature crisis and it's a health and and social inequalities crisis and if you just focus on on carbon uh, for example and just think oh we've got a climate crisis you can be let off sound down some quite unhelpful routes um which at the moment our, our government is is pursuing so you you could be uh planting loads of bioenergy crops and big monoculture plantations of trees which uh, tick the carbon box but further degrade and uh, wildlife further deplete soils um and exacerbate potentially um uh, some of the health issues that we have uh, when you join it all together when you think okay how do we farm in a way that is good for nature is good for the climate and is good for our health then you arrive at, at, at agroecology yeah which means uh, these organic style farming systems absolutely yeah. it's such an interesting topic this and it, it feels like it's not just in food and farming but across like everything to do with like the climate mitigation um movement as a whole like and it's almost no surprise that the government is subsidizing the move towards this climate emphasis at the detriment to like the other things that we've been talking about because it's probably the only way they can make large profit at the end of the day and because it leads further down the down the line of like control mm. and removal of power from communities and local local agriculture yeah so i mean farmers um in the uk get blamed for everything and it's and and farming is at the heart of so many of our our, our issues but a lot of them are um uh, are um stuck in systems that that aren't necessarily of their choosing which are contributing to the problem and the the national farmers union has, has set this ambition of becoming carbon neutral by 2040 which sounds like a really great thing but they're they're because they want to you know be on the front foot and they want to be part of the solution but the the avenue um that they're pursuing to get there is um is uh really the wrong one um uh, and but but they're kind of beholden to their members. Many farmers are, are locked into very specialised production systems where it's not easy to just go agroecological, and it's not necessarily um, in their power to do so. There are whole complex supply chains that they're plugged into, um, and reintroducing um, kind of uh, rotations as we we're talking about into into their system and farming a greater diversity of, of plants and animals um, isn't isn't that straightforward. They need to find routes to market. They don't necessarily have the skills. Um, so that we we have a bit of a, a lock-in in some places um, where we we need different farming policy and incentives to farmers to to help them out of that. But we also need to just redesign our food system and the whole infrastructure around farming to to support that more agroecological approach. Yeah. So in the meantime, what should we really be doing? Going to local farmers markets, supporting people, young farmers. Like, what should we? Yeah. So I mean, as a as a shopper, a consumer, a citizen, um, you can be um, seeking out organic food um, in in supermarkets. That it's often there, and it's often not as that expensive. Actually, and it is a bit more expensive, but but not necessarily that much more. But also um, finding out who your local farmers are, organic or non-organic, and, and going to your local farmers market, getting involved in box schemes, um, and buying direct from the farmer can can support them because it cuts out the middleman. Um, if you want to get your, your hands dirty, there are community supported agriculture projects where you can um, you become part of a sort of farm co-op and or otherwise community growing projects as well. Um, so all of these um, are, are, are part of the solution. Yes, yeah, so there's lots of things you can do. And what about policy change? Is there something people can do when they want to like at that level? Yeah, well, I mean, the. There, there's huge policy changes going on uh, in relation to food and farming and the environment all related to Brexit. Um, and there are, I guess, if you want to get in, involved at that level, then you can be writing to your MP, but also um, supporting organisations like the Soil Association, which is really lobbying hard on, on all this stuff. And and there are uh, on, on the website, um, there are different uh, ways for supporters and, and members of the public to get involved and, and start influencing some of those policymakers, because it's, it's a really important time. It's everything to play for. Brexit could pan out to a, a much greener and... and um, uh, more ecological farming system and some of the pieces of the puzzle are in place but there's 
uh, huge risks um, uh, as well related to trade deals and and this policy all falling apart. And is um, Soil Association is is it just UK focused? So we we work um, with partners across Europe um, in in the other organic organisations and organic standards are defined in law across Europe. So historically, it's been um, quite a European focus. Um, and we also have a forestry division that certifies sustainable forests, um, 14 million hectares all around the world. Um, but most of the work is UK focused. Okay, yeah. yeah. What's a sustainable forest? Um, so it's a bit like um, uh, FSC. We, we, okay. we act as a certification for, for um, where those forests are managed, whether or not wild forests um, that, that they're being managed. It's like not a system. forest monoculture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to touch um, a bit more on insects and insect yeah. decline because um, I was reading that um, that what's the pesticide called the insecticide? I I've actually got it written down. But let's have a go exp- saying it. Neon. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ne- yeah. Let's say it again. Neonectinoids. Yeah. No, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. Um, but yeah, apparently there there were samples taken of. Um, bees honey across the world and 75% of that honey showed that it had been contaminate, contaminated with that insecticide that I can't pronounce yeah. um, and so even though the, like, the UK has banned it it's still, it's still all over the, being used all over the world so like what are insecticides and why are they being used and what are the dangers yeah um, so uh, insecticides are, are broadly speaking a, a, a chemical um, products that um, farmers will spray on their crops to stop beasties from eating them. So when you're farming organically, you you nurture a, a, a kind of a, a complex ecosystem on the farm that means that you have uh, bugs eating bugs and birds eating bugs and, and there are things attacking your crops, but you, uh, you manage that through all those biological interactions and you have a slightly lower yield as a result, but uh, you don't need the chemicals. Um, but, but most farmers um, use a, a variety of, of, of chemical products and, and you mentioned that the, the, that variety has been increasing in recent years. There's even more. Um, and neonicotinoids um, were uh, recently uh, banned across the EU because we realized or we came to understand that, that they were negatively affecting uh, bee populations. Um, they're se- essentially a, a nerve agent. Um, so you, they're, they're sprayed uh, on, on crops uh, such as oilseed rape um, to, to take out some of the bugs that would have um, that would have uh, eaten that crop. Um, but they end up um, in the soil, in waterways. They're taken up by plants. They end up in plant pollen and in, 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 the, um, uh, in the plant itself. And then when, when bees uh, feed on those plants and go from plant to plant, uh, they end up um, with, with neonicotinoids and other chemicals in, in their bodies. And, and the problem with neonicotinoids seem to be around bee memories. Um, so they... Uh, essentially lost their memory. They couldn't find their way back or they couldn't remember where they'd been. A um, uh, bit more complicated than that, but 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 um, uh, it quickly became or fairly rapidly became clear that they were a major a major problem. So so they've now gone from the EU, but they're still being used around the world. And we're still using um, uh, a variety of other chemicals in the UK and across the EU. Um, and they're um, one of the ma- major issues um, uh, with our regulation system um, is that it doesn't look at how those chemicals interact with each other. So the gov- government will look at one chemical at a time and say, okay, is this safe? How much of it is safe? How much can we allow in food? How much can we allow farmers to use? And then they'll move on to the next one. But farmers are, are spraying a, a cocktail of, of pesticides um, and they interact in unex- unexpected ways. Um, in, a, in a single bee, you might have seven different um, uh, pesticides um, and we don't know it's impossible to to map out how those thousands of chemicals once they get in the environment when they end up in soils and plants and wildlife um, how they interact but there is an emerging body of, of evidence suggesting that they are um, bad for our health and they're bad for for, for insects and pollinators and wildlife more yeah. generally and if there's no pollinators there's no we have no food like we right. were like well, so they're making and... they're making drone bees <laughs> robo bees i wouldn't so be surprised like, if the people with the patent on the drone bees also have the patent on the you know <laughs> civilizations at an end when you see a yeah, drone yeah there's bees. four labs making robo bees it's like right. to yeah. to prepare like i bet they're just it's, it's awful isn't it yeah, yeah i mean globally disturbing. um there's a, a third of all insect species are um uh, threatened with extinction. We're losing insect biomass at 2.5% a year, which is enormous. I mean, if you extrapolate that 50 years, there's not much left. And the extinction rates are 
eight times higher than for mammals and birds and reptiles. Um, and and it, there, there are a variety of drivers. Um, it's related to um, urbanization and various climate change, even the changing temperatures. Um, but pesticides are, are at the heart of it. Mm. And um, I have another question on a disturbing topic <laughs> about um, the we only have 30 more harvests left. Yeah. Is, and what is that? What does that mean? What does that mean globally? And what's breadbasket failure? So we the, these numbers are slightly plucked out of thin air. Um, 30 harvests left, 60, 60 harvests left. Um, they're usually extrapolations from a certain rate of soil degradation. So we know we're, we're losing topsoil at a certain rate. We're not replenishing it. If you look into the future, that means at some point um, we're going to struggle to feed ourselves. It's it's complicated in the UK. I don't think it's true to say that we we only have thirty harvests left. Although there are some areas of the UK in the in the east of England where where soil degradation is accelerating to the point where bits of land are becoming unproductive. Um, but but certainly when you look ahead into what's in store for us in the next fifty years. Um, uh, we we could well be facing some major food crises. Um, Breadbasket failure is is the term they use to describe um, what happens when uh, an area of the world that produces lots of our food uh, suddenly becomes unproductive for whatever reason. So if you have a um, uh, if you look around the world, there are the the food the, the world's food is is produced in a, a small number of concentrated areas. Um, and if you have, a, for example, a drought in one of those areas, then then suddenly you're you're short of food, and there are price spikes, and 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 that have various social implications to that. Um, generally speaking, um, for the last couple of decades, um, the the global food system has been interconnected enough that um, in the UK or, or um, more wealthy nations, we haven't really uh, felt the effects of of um, uh, famine and uh, sorry droughts and and uh, major weather events elsewhere. But looking ahead, um, the the chances of what they call multi breadbasket failure are increasing. So where you have simultaneous events, um, uh, extreme weather events, flooding and 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 droughts and so on, um, hitting the world's food supply in ways that create uh, potential geopolitical unrest that that affect food prices in the UK that. Um, in a way that would certainly affect, um, have knock-on implications for the health and well-being of of, of the less affluent. Um, so the, it's a bit of a concerning picture when you look ahead, which is why we need to start investing in our soils and, and farming yeah. more. Can you replenish soil once it's been degraded? You can, yeah. Um, wow. So um, by by these organic and agroecological um, uh, approaches, and regenerative farming is another um, kind of umbrella phrase, which means broadly the same thing. So if you take um, land out of its uh, intensive uh, monocrop uh, production system and, and put it back into this rotation where you're, you're resting it and you're replenishing it, you're integrating livestock in, into the picture to, to add their manures, um, and you're um, growing some of these uh, leguminous plants which capture nitrogen from the air and put it back into the soil, uh, and you, you, you do that, you can actually regenerate soils um, fairly quickly not as quickly as you can degrade them but it but it can be done um so it's um uh but but it, we're getting to the stage now globally where um uh the the climate impact and the, the the loss of um insects will start to reach this sort of runaway point where where it's very difficult to claw it back from so it's really now or never in a sense yeah, yeah. and what about rewilding because rewilding mm. seems to have been painted with this all glory for brush <laughs> but i'm not sure if it is always like could you tell a bit more yeah, rewilding. so rewilding has, has become a very contentious word uh, among some people. So for it, it's a very trendy concept in, in, in some communities, but among farmers, it's very unpopular. It can be very divisive. Um, uh, at one end of the spectrum, you have the sort of George Monbiot approach um, or, or what might be a caricature of George Monbiot's approach, which is getting farmers off the land um, and, and letting it regenerate. So if you look at the Welsh uplands where there are sheep and there's not much else, um, and they're arguably overgrazed, um, Mombi, I would say. Um, if you uh, remove um, humans and, and livestock and farmers uh, and let the land just regenerate in a big tangle and let the forests come back, then that could have huge ecological benefits. Um, but that, and that's the sort of all or nothing scenario. There's actually a more of a spectrum of, um, of rewilding that can take place or ecological gen regeneration um, where you have the, at that one end, you have get all the humans off the land and let it do its own thing. And in the middle, you have um, 
uh, supporting farmers to plant trees and adopt more agroforestry style um, farming systems. So this is where trees and um, uh, uh, are integrated into the the picture in a way that creates a much more complicated on farm ecosystem. And we and um, there are there are ways that you can that government could be supporting farmers to. Uh, to both plant bits of woodland and to farm more organically and to let bits of their land regenerate in this sort of rewilding way, which isn't the the total all or nothing picture, which is sometimes painted. So it, I, I think it is part of the solution, um, but it has to be a, a farmer led uh, initiative. Otherwise, it's going to be too divisive to ever yeah, take off. Our aunt is a farmer. And um, and so like a lot of George Monbiot's work I, I love. Um, but so I would like post articles and things about rewilding. And then, yeah, they, she wouldn't be happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wouldn't be happy about it. And and it's funny because now, now as I've learned more about agroecology and like rotational farming, my understanding of rewilding of veganism is like more nuanced. And um, I think it's you know, because if if you'd asked me a few years ago, you know, if you had like one wish for the environment, what would it be? It'd probably be like everyone's vegan and we completely stop <laughs> using, um, you know. Uh, having livestock and like whilst I still might adhere to a vegan diet I'm like now coming to understand that actually there is a place for high welfare um, livestock that's organic and free range on on the land and like I actually just saying that I feel uncomfortable because it's so not a part of like the narrative that I have been adhering to Um, because the worry with um, the end result of George Monbiot saying that everyone off the land um, and just give it back to nature which is in, in in one way amazing but then what that means is that we then have lab grown food because like we still mm. need to eat so where's our mm. food coming from and then you have a complete disconnection of um people from their food and 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 like increasing industrialization and a lowering of like community empowerment and mm. and actually like learning to live in harmony with with nature and with its cycles and it's that's also very dystopian um yeah and also it's unlikely that it would be everybody off the land but what is probably more likely is it would be lots of people off the land what's left would be intensification of farming with gm potentially and lab grown yeah. food so it just creates the divide even more yeah. extreme mm-hmm. yeah um and and exactly so there's not one a one size fits all solution and, and george is quite helpful in that he takes these extreme views which then open up more of the nuance in the middle um, but um, yeah, ecosystems are, are complicated and, and farming with nature is complicated. So you often need animals in the mix. Um, and while there's some scope for um, freeing up land for, for rewilding and, and trees and so on, um, I think uh, an, an over reliance on lab grown food could could have some really unhelpful consequences. So the, the kind of history of uh, in terms of health implications of industrial food and ultra processed foods is not particularly good that in the UK we we consume the the highest uh, percentage of ultra processed foods so really heavily processed foods in in Europe it's it's far more it's 52 percent of family food purchases here compared to 14 percent in France and 13 wow. percent in Italy wow. and it's directly correlated with um, all sorts of health outcomes like obesity and um, uh, diabetes and and so on and and we know that it's partly because of the the gut microbiome when you're eating real foods it's not just a, um, a list of nutrients it's all these other complicated compounds and they all interact in, in in complicated ways to 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 deliver those health benefits and and i guess there's huge uncertainty around george's precision fermentation as he calls it um, and other lab-grown food uh, approaches that they, they could have a really important role to play if we run out of food and in taking just generally in taking pressure off the land but um, i think relying on them is is dangerous mm-hmm. I think generally what I'm finding more and more is dangerous is any argument that becomes like fundamentalist <laughs> in in approach is dangerous because like the the world is so complex these ecosystems are so complex different ways in which different cultures live already is so like so different so I think like no one can become too like polemical about how about what the solutions might be um, yeah absolutely and this principle of diversity is really the heart of organic farming so if you're um if you're trying to um farm organically then you're trying to nurture uh, biodiversity soil microbial diversity you're you're um trying to build um genetic diversity into the foods and animals that you're farming 
um, your your um, uh, because you're farming in a way that's attuned to your locale. If you look across the the country, there's more of a diversity of farming approaches and systems, um, and we've really lost sight of uh, the value of diversity. We eat um, globally. You know, there's three hundred thousand odd edible plants, and we eat mainly about a dozen. And we've been uh, intensively um, cultivating those uh, those plants and the animals that we eat. Um, to, to grow faster and more uniformly in a way that is eroding genetic diversity. Um, uh, and, and it leaves the food system incredibly fragile and vulnerable. Um, so when you're looking at um, solutions to the climate crisis more, more broadly, um, uh, then I think, yeah, your, your, your point about not being polemical and seeking a diversity of, of, uh, of, um, of solutions is is really important because that's the way the world works when it's yeah. functioning properly yeah. yeah but it's that crisis mentality which is meaning that we're becoming more polemical and you know governments for example which is great you know addressing climate change we need to be um but then like not addressing environmental destruction in general and going back to like the founding principles of soil association like everything is interconnected in the health of the planet health of the people are two sides of the same coin you know so it's so, like, we need to be as holistic as possible um, when we're looking for looking yeah. for solutions. Yeah. Um, speaking of solutions, are there any... So, we've spoken about, like, individual actions mm-hmm. and some policy. Is there anything else that we should be bearing in mind? Um, I mean, I guess there's... Um, so, there's a the kind of government-level stuff and there's what you can do as an individual. There's a lot of... Um, uh, really uh, impressive stuff going on at kind of local and, and city levels as well across the UK. So there's a um, Soil Association Helps coordinate something called the Sustainable Food Cities Network, where um, local uh, kind of partnerships have, have evolved between um, citizens and food businesses and local councillors, and they've put together a local food plan and they're working with all their local schools and hospitals and, and retailers uh, to make um, kind of healthier and more sustainable food more normal and accessible and uh, and, and so on um, and we uh, while we need all the government policy solutions to be in place there's a huge amount that we can just get on with at a local level um, uh, in the meantime um, so um, uh, I'd encourage anyone to look up uh, the Sustainable Food Cities Network see what's going on and, and find a way to, to take part and if you're not UK based then perhaps trying to start something similar <laughs> yeah exactly I mean I think um, you know change um, has to come from the, the ground up as well as from the top down so all, all kinds of grassroots um, uh, local and sustainable food initiatives um, uh, are contributing to, to the solution so wherever you are in the world um, seek out your your local organic farmers. Um, find if there are local growing groups and and, and communities based around um, uh, um, uh, local farming networks. And and yeah, get involved. That um, there's a saying. Well, there's a sentence on um, soil association, and it's it's I, or, I don't know, but it says saving the earth starts from the ground up. And I love that because you know climate change environmental destruction is so overwhelming it's quite nice to just be able to like look down at the soil and start from there <laughs> in your way in like near where you live um, also like ground starts from the ground up like decentralizing and people power and coming together local communities like it's the ultimate empowering thing yeah absolutely well. yeah yeah and um and yeah soil provides um, a very helpful metaphor for a lot of a lot of what's going on um, exactly. with with the climate crisis but but certainly that that gla- grassroots action and decentralized uh, response is is a key part of the solution yeah yeah cool well thank you so much rob thank, thank you, you for having me thank you